Welcome to worship this morning. It's the third Sunday of Easter and we're just so delighted. We're gonna hang out in the message today in 1 John 1 and 2. Next week, we're gonna take a look at 1 John 3. John's epistles are powerful. He's, he's known as the apostle of love and he's gonna exude the love of Christ and why it's important and how we have fellowship with the Father and the Son, and it all works together. So today, I'm so excited to share that message with you. Let's begin in a word of prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for being our advocate, the one who stands and pleads our cause. And so, Lord, we learn about that today. Lord, sometimes we feel so judged, so judged by the world, by the people around us, even by ourselves. We can be hard on ourselves. And sometimes we're not hard at all. We just look past the sin in our lives. But Lord, both are mistakes. And so Lord, help us to land in the center of where you want us to be, in the truth of your word, in our walk with Christ, O oh Lord, guide us and keep us and move your spirit in our hearts this day. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing our opening hymn. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. John writes, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So let us pray. Lord, we are very good at spotting sin in others, but we have blind spots to our own. Sin isn't a popular word but painful to think about and troubling when we find it in us. 
We have a tendency to deny it and minimize it and make excuses for it and blame it on others. But the word we hear today tells us that we must deal with it. Repent of sin. Confessing our sins to you, we ask your forgiveness and grace to be upon us. In you, Lord, we find healing, hope, and cleansing. We trust in the blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, shed for every sinner and every sin, that we might know the power of your forgiveness and true fellowship with you again. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. O God, through the humiliation of your Son, you raised up the fallen world. Grant to your faithful people, rescued from the peril of everlasting death, perpetual gladness and eternal joys. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. This is from the book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 11 through 21. While he clung to Peter and John, all of the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over, and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 through chapter 2, verse 11. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the pro <laughs> pro propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, 
but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Beloved, I am writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him. There is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. The Holy Gospel for this Sunday is taken from Luke, the 24th chapter, beginning at verse 36. Glory to you, O Lord. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened, and they thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still, while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Morning, boys and girls. Welcome to the children's story. I asked Stephanie to come with me outside because I wanted to do it from my tailgate. Last night, um, something special happened while I was on this tailgate. My little boy Ezra was sitting next to me. We were eating some Carl's Jr. I have not eaten there, I think, hardly ever. But while we were there, we were just waiting for my other boy to finish soccer. And somebody, a stranger, came and approached. And I was safe, and Ezra was safe. It wasn't that issue. But he had a strange request. He said, can I borrow some money to get a haircut? Now, you know how important a haircut is. Maybe this last year during COVID-19, you got a little shaggy. I know I get some shaggy and it's like, and so I need a barber to come in and they might use scissors and they might use a comb and they might even use clippers and they'll cut that hair and you'll start looking better again. Well, I could tell this guy needed a haircut. He looked kind of like the guy in this picture or this picture. It looked like he had a lion's mane. He had a full head of hair, but it, it was came back almost like Mufasa's. And he said, I need a haircut because tomorrow I stand before a judge. What was he saying? Maybe his lawyer told him he needed to look a little clean, cleaner cut. 
but he wanted to give a good impression to the judge. Today we're going to talk about that a little bit because we know sometimes we're not at our best. We, sometimes we've been naughty, sometimes we have backtalked, sometimes we've just thrown a fit and we know we didn't look very good, we didn't act very good, and we, and we don't feel very presentable to God or to anybody else. But in the Bible story today, Jesus says He's our advocate. He not only sees where we've messed up, but He cleans us up in His forgiveness and in His love. And He reminds us, you are my child and I have loved you with an everlasting love. And so because you're mine, I give you my gift of cleansing, of a perfect score, because that's what Jesus earned for us. So that's good news. And today, I hope that guy, he's got a clean head of hair and, and uh, he's just ready to stand, knowing that there is one who stands with him, our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for those precious moments when you just bring people into our lives and that you teach us, that you use us. In your word today, it says, if we walk in the light, even as he is in the light, we have fellowship with God. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us, makes us clean. And so, Lord, cleanse us again today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God's word for us this morning is taken from 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 through chapter 2, verse 2. And the theme is our advocate, the righteous one, in Jesus' name. I want to show you two pictures. Do you know who this one is? I know it's dated. 
It's a TV show that came out in the 50s. I was watching reruns even as a kid, but if you know who he is, you know why he was so important. Now look at this one. Came years later, played the same role. Both are lawyers. Both took on cases that seemed almost indefensible, almost cut and dried, found, but they found out the facts and they defended their clients. If you were ever to stand before a judge, you would want a guy or a gal like Perry Mason or like Ben Matlock, someone who would plead your case before a judge or jury because when all seemed lost, they solved the case, they exposed the guilty, and the innocent were set free. Well, this morning we are continuing in 1 John and, and chapters 1 and 2. And St. John has said he wants us to experience full joy in the Lord and in the fellowship with him. But we real, need to realize that Jesus is only, only an advocate for people who see themselves as a moral failure, only for people who see themselves as not being worthy to go before the judge on their own. We're totally unprepared, and there's no merit we can claim to get us off the sentence we deserve. And so if we don't see that, then we're not able to experience true fellowship with the Father, that intimacy we long for. If we don't realize that, in essence, we're going to fall into one of two categories. And the first one is this. Those who don't sense or feel that they are a moral failure. They don't feel that they're just that bad. They feel, I tried my best. I know I'm not perfect. I'm better than most. I will plead my merits. I deserve a pass. And I have a right to go in. Now, the second or the opposite extreme. Those who have an overwhelming sense of their failure and their guilt. You're just crushed under it. And you refuse even to lift your eyes to heaven. You feel that the holiness of God is, is just so overwhelming that you don't even want to be in his presence. And so you shy away, you run away, you isolate, and you struggle. This week, in L.A., there was a mom that was being hunted because her two kids were found dead. She's the only suspect. Apparently, she carjacked uh, somebody in order to get away. And it hurts. Because we hard, can't hardly believe a mother whose love is so great to be sacrificial would take the lives of her own kids. But almost every day somewhere in the country, we see that sin just comes and grabs people out of communities, out of, out of families, out of even churches at times, people who have done horrendous things. We'd like to think that it isn't possible. And maybe we're shocked by it or we're delusioned by it. But if we are, we haven't been reading our Bibles. You see, the Bible tells us the ugly truth. And we like to forget it and we like to deny it, but John won't let us go there. In verse 8 we read, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. In verse 10 he says something very similar. He says, If we claim we have not sinned, we make him, that is God, out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Two false claims. I haven't sinned. I'm without sin. What John is saying, everyone has this sin nature that works in a, its way out in destructive and blinding ways. God's truth bears it out. And if we claim it, it, it doesn't, then we are either in denial or we're calling God a liar. Those are strong words. John Newton, the pastor who, who penned Amazing Grace, wrote in a letter, he said, you never learn you're a sinner by being told. You only ever learn that you're a sinner by being shown. We need somebody to help point it out that it might dawn on us. 
Pascal says, certainly nothing offends us more than the doctrine of original sin. Yet without this mystery, the most incomprehensible of all, we are incomprehensible to ourselves. I think that's profound. In other words, what Pascal is saying is that there's no way of explaining the propensity within each of us to stray from God into idolatry or self-centeredness or lust or greed or slander or gossip, fits of anger or hard-heartedness, hate or bigotry, unbelief, indifference or injustice. The list goes on. The pool of evil is almost beyond our comprehension of what the human heart, where the human heart can go. In fact, Luther said sin is being curved in on ourselves, thinking that we are the center of our world instead of God. So that's the bad news. The first thing you see, need to see, therefore, to be in fellowship with God is that we're not worthy to go in. The second thing that we need to see is that God has provided a way. He's provided an advocate uh, with the Father. In fact, we read again from 1 John 2, chapter 1. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. So let's ask three questions in light of this. First of all, what is an advocate? And this is a beautiful thing. The text says that when we sin, we have a paraclete. It, it can mean advocate with the Father. This paraclete, we know Jesus is a paraclete. We know the Holy Spirit is another paraclete. It's one who stands alongside us. And, and a lawyer in this context would be that kind of person, somebody who has a legal proxy, even one who has the power of attorney. In that case, the lawyer stands in your place to represent you, to represent the client. And the lawyer, what the lawyer achieves, the client achieves. What the lawyer loses, the client loses. And Charles Hodges put it this way. He says the relationship of Christ to his people is that of a legal advocate to a client. The lawyer stands in the client's place. And, as well, and while it lasts, this relationship, this most intimate of relationships, he says you may not even have to appear in court. You are not heard. You are not regarded. You are lost in your advocate who for the time being is your representative, he or she is seen and heard and regarded, not you. It is someone who is a total representative of you. So second question to look at is if Jesus is our advocate, what is he doing on our behalf? Friends, lawyers can be astronomically expensive. But you hire them because you, they can make a case that you couldn't on your own. And so Jesus is up there pleading before the Father, through, before his throne for your sake and on your behalf. So look at the text again. John writes, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. You and I might imagine um, Jesus saying to the Father something like this, yeah, I know Bill messed up again. Even after all the chances you've given him, after all the sermons that he's preached, after the Bible studies, he's old enough, he should know better. But Lord, have mercy on him. Father, have mercy on him. And you might imagine that. And you may wonder in your mind, when is the Father going to have enough? When, he's gonna, when is he going to be fed up or give up or move on? But when John describes Jesus, our advocate, notice he doesn't call him the merciful one or the persuasive one or the patient one. He says, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Now, he's all three of the other things, but John is pointing out the righteousness of Jesus. And that's important. That is key. You see, a good lawyer has to have a case. Jesus' case is his atoning sacrifice that he shed his blood for us on our behalf to pay our debt. 
Therefore, the teaching of this passage, this is so absolutely startling, which is absolutely unparalleled in, in any other religion. Jesus Christ isn't up there pleading for our forgiveness. He's not up there asking for mercy. Jesus is telling the Father what the law is. Jesus stands before the Father, before the justice of God, and relentlessly and continually says something more like this. Father, yes, Bill did it again. But I have died the death that he should have died, and I have lived the life that he should have lived in his place. I am his advocate. He is lost in me. When you look at him, you have to see me, Father. You have to see all that I have done. You have to see all that I am. Therefore, Father, it would be unjust to demand two payments for the same sin. I have already paid it for him. Therefore, Father, I don't ask for mercy. I demand justice, your perfect justice. Where does John mention justice in this text? You read it before. It's found in verse 9. That if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. And he will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. God is faithful and just. Jesus hasn't just given you forgiveness, my friend. He's, he's the one the Father chose, who stands for us, who shares with you His perfect righteousness. So how does that change our lives? That's what we want to come down to today. First and finally, you can deal with, with your guilt. God isn't just simply merciful, not punishing us for the sins we deserve. That's what mercy means. Yes, he's merciful, and that's our heart's cry for mercy. But the righteousness we have in Jesus means that he accepts us, which is so much more, that he accepts us totally, that he loves us completely. That's why Paul begins that, that great chapter of Romans 8, one of the most gospel-filled chapters, with these words, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, when you think about that word, no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, we are acquitted, we are set free. The sins that, that clung to us cling to us no more. And he breaks out with joy, joy filled with good news and echoes of this truth. As we get later in that chapter, in Romans 8, beginning at verse 33, he says, who will bring a charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. God justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, and more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Did you catch that? Jesus is interceding for us. God justifies as Jesus intercedes. So who will bring a charge against God's elect? That's the question Paul raises. Now take that question and bring it into your own life, into your own heart, into your own struggles, into your own self-talk. And I want you to think about this. Turn that accusing voice inside you that says, Jesus Christ is my advocate, of course. And I've done these things, and God knows that. But when he sees me, he sees my advocate. I'm lost in my advocate. And, he, and what he sees, he sees is Christ's righteousness. And so I'm saved in him. No longer am I a loser or a screw-up or a failure. I am saved. I am rescued. I am his. Do you see the difference? It affects our whole approach on life, our whole attitude, our whole emotional well-being. To see who we are in the light of what God says we are. Not to live in denial that we have had struggles, that we have had failures, but to see the remedy is already provided in Jesus. So what else does that bring to you? 
It is that he, it is the only way for us to deal with disappointment. I want you to think for a moment about Peter. He was a leader among the disciples. He walked on the water. He made the great confession. He was willing to fight those who came to arrest Jesus in the garden. He pulled out a sword. Wasn't good with it, but he tried. But friends in Christ, when he got in the courtyard of, of Caiaphas, he melted. His courage turned to cowardice. His confession turned to cursing. His denial, well, it flowed from him three times. When Jesus looked at Peter that night and the rooster crowed, what did Peter do? He went outside the gate and he wept bitterly. He knew he blew it. Disappointed more than we can imagine. Some leader Peter was. He failed. Friends, we have two. And most of our deepest yearnings are actually efforts to be what Jesus Christ should be for you. That we could be righteous before God on our own. That we can save ourselves and earn our pardon. But no degree, but to the degree that we grasp what Jesus has done as our advocate to the Father, we'll be able to take criticism, we'll be able to take rejection, we'll be able to admit sin and guilt, and we'll face it, and with God's help deal with it, and not be slaves to it anymore. Why is that? Because the Holy Spirit reminds us of where we stand, and how we stand, and when we sin, that we have one who speaks to the Father on our defense. Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins. So do you remember what an advocate is? That it's an intimate relationship. That if He wins, you win. And you experience full acceptance. In Jesus' name, amen. May the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus and a life everlasting. Amen. Let's now respond to the message we've heard as we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. He was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, how wonderful you are, how amazing in all your ways. We thank you that you are both holy and just. And Lord, you are merciful and mighty. You are gracious in all your ways. But Lord, in your justice, you demand payment for sin. In your mercy and grace, you provided it in your Son. That's why Jesus is the only way, that he is the truth, that he is the life. And our world bristles at that truth. 
because it seems too narrow in a, in a society that wants everything to be inclusive. But Lord, we know truth is truth, and you define truth. And so, Lord, as we acknowledge our sin, it, it is a sign that the truth is within us, that, that we know that, that we struggle, that we have failed, that we have hurt people, that we have hurt your heart. But in your mercy and grace, you cover us in the blood of Christ. He, he is our advocate that pleads for justice because the payment's been made and we stand in Christ, our advocate. So Lord, today I pray for the young men and women that will face a judge in the weeks or months ahead. I pray for the families that are in crisis, and I ask of God that you would help them meet the needs, the emotional, the spiritual, the physical needs. Uh, Lord, for those that have COVID, that you would help them to recover. For those looking for vaccines, that you would open the door, that you would provide the way. Lord, for those businesses that struggle because of the shutdowns and the restrictions, Lord, that you would just keep them afloat. And Lord, that you would open the doors, that they can open their doors wider and rebuild again. And Lord, we pray for those who in their, in their latter years are, are weaker. Maybe some are struggling to remember. Maybe some are just transitioning and, it, and it's hard because as we get older, some of our friends and some of our family go before us. So in this Easter title, oh Lord, remind us that you again are the resurrection and the life and that those who, who die in faith live with you forever. And so, Lord, comfort them and give us all hope because our life isn't measured in just a few years, but our lives are eternal in you. So, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And, Lord, we pray um, also for the marriages that are troubled, for the kids that are struggling in this year of, of pandemic. We pray for the teachers who have needed to teach in a new way and the stress that, is, that it has caused. Lord, help us in this hour of need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And for those who've undergone surgery, we pray for complete healing, for renewed strength. Lord, for uh, the cessation of pain, or Lord, the grace to handle it. So Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide our nation, guide our governors, guide our local governments, that we may move in a way that pleases you, because so often society has wild thoughts far removed from your will and plan at least from the truth of your word. So, Lord, guide us again. We pray this morning for those that um, have unplanned pregnancies, those that are facing situations that are beyond them, that are above them. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to find resources for those, those people in ways that um, will help them so that they see that they have an option other than abortion. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you do care for us, that you guide us and that you use us to bless the lives of others. We pray this all in Jesus' name, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We now give you an opportunity to participate in worship in another way as we bring our offerings to the Lord. And, and you've offered your time to be in the Word and to hear His message. Now we get a chance to offer some of our resources that return to Him in thanksgiving for all that He's given us. So you can do that by giving to the Lord through Trinity, Sheridan, 
and we have an opportunity on the on the on our website and we also have an opportunity if you want to mail in an offering we'll make sure that gets gets recorded for you thank you for your support also just a word of uh, of announcement we continue to worship at 10 a.m uh, every sunday live we have a bible study that is both on zoom and live at nine o'clock and every other sunday including this sunday we have drive up communion and it will be from 11 30 to noon we pray that you have a blessed week. Receive now the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>